Good morning. Today's lecture will be devoted to the one of the most fascinating and still not completely explained by contemporary physics phenomenon in uh, continuous media physics. Namely, we are going to talk about the theory and experiments on turbulence. Uh, let me first share the screen. Uh, this is the picture taken on the, as far as I understood, at the airport in Chicago, showing the giant vortices spilling off the wings of one of the first jumbo jets uh, starting from that uh, uh, airport. Uh, the interest of the airports in the, what happens with these giant vortex perturbations of the air caused by the, at that time, the biggest airplanes commercially operated, uh, the jumbo jets, was caused by the accident when the other planes landing or starting on the um, runways adjacent to the runways on which these huge airplanes were starting uh, had been seriously affected and there were some uh, pretty dangerous accidents caused by that. As you see, there is a tremendous change of the flow, uh, which we so far discuss and call a laminar flow, when uh, the streamlines for the velocity field uh, have been parallel to each other, or if they change, they were changing very smoothly and on a relatively large distances, while in this, vortex here, we see a rapid change and we have on the one, in the one phenomenon, a vortices of a different sizes, a small size, which is created at the beginning of the change of the flow pattern from a laminar uh, and the huge one which then they are dissipated in the surrounding air by a phenomenon. And that phenomenon, as we shall see, is related to the viscosity of the air. And we just have discussed what the rule in the flow, so far laminar flows uh, of the liquids, the viscosity play. The fact that the most of the flows of the liquids in the nature uh, turns from a laminar into the turbulent on the various occasions have been uh, discussed uh, probably for the first time in the history of science by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, and um, this is the picture of the Leonardo da Vinci of the river uh, next to the Florence, which he uh, observed and took a picture of the flow of the water in the river next to the water mills. And this is the one of the drawings of the Leonardo da Vinci, which shows on the right side of the picture how the laminar flow of a liquid probably falling from the upper pond into the lower pond in the uh, next to the water mill is dramatically changing from a laminar flow. Here the streamlines are parallel to each other into the mess of a vortex of a different scale in the flow in the lower pond. Uh, this is a turbulence uh, in the history, but it is still 
one of the problems which people are uh, trying to understand in greater detail and uh, to show you that even the most advanced part of the contemporary physics is busy with the problem of a turbulence. I'm uh, showing you here a picture from a, a internal journal, Pittsburgh Quantum Institute, a organization of the major universities operating uh, in uh, Pittsburgh in the United States. And that particular article is about uh, use of a quantum computers, this hypothetical uh, machines, which if they will eventually be built, uh, will probably completely change the way we are operating uh, uh, computers, uh, not only to analyze physical processes. And uh, this article describes uh, computer program developed by continuous media theoreticians and engineers to simulate the flow, turbulent flow of a liquid on a quantum computer, assuming that the quantum computer will eventually be built. So that is just to show that the turbulence is extremely active field of research even now. Uh, all right, so let's start uh, looking at the turbulent flow in some greater detail. And uh, for today lecture, we will be only discussing a viscose fluid, which is incompressible. And that means that divergence of the velocity field is equal to zero. And that is uh, shown on the right hand side and the, and the upper right corner of the screen. And the experimental fact is that the flow changes from a laminar into the, this mixed up turbulent flow when the Reynolds number is large. So we shall study the flow of incompressible viscose fluid for the large Reynolds number. And then as you remember, we, instead of the shear viscosity, use the kinematic shear viscosity, which is uh, just the shear viscosity divided by a density. And the density is constant by the incompressibility assumption. So let me show you a picture. Uh, which is the modern picture of the Leonardo da Vinci drawing. This is a turbulent wake of a moving boat on, I don't know, it's a sea or, a, or, a, or on an ocean. And on the right hand side, you have a beautiful picture taken in the, in the experimental camera in, in the lab which uh, 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 allows us to see in greater detail what is happening with the streamlines. And that is, as you see, the laminar flow. There is a certain transition region. And then all over the sudden, the vortices are created. And those vortices eventually decay into a mess of much smaller vortices somewhere here. All right. so. Already on that picture, we see that the laminar flow decays in the turbulent flow, fully developed turbulent flow, by first create by first a large vortices which are created in the flow, and then those huge vortices, like that on the airport in Chicago, are decaying into the many other which are much smaller. This is the picture of a computer simulation. Well, it's still not on the quantum computer, but on the supercomputer, which shows 
mathematically what we have seen before in a real experiment. We have a full laminar flow, which at the certain velocity of a flow, that is when the Reynolds damper becomes large, all over the sudden starts to becoming a turbulent. And that is, of course, the fully developed turbulent region. All right. So, uh, well, that's another picture which I have for you. And this picture shows you that uh, kind of a diagrammatic uh, simplified version that here we have a laminar flow. We put some dye, uh, which allows us to trace what happens with the given streamline. And then it gets, in, we observe the creation of these large vortices. And these large vortices then decay into a smaller vortices and so forth. So on this right picture, we have a diagram where uh, on the uh, horizontal axis, we have the diameter of the eddies. These vortices in the parlor of the turbulence theory are called eddies. And uh, on the y-axis, we have the orbital velocity of the uh, vortex. And uh, we see that the velocity changes. The small vortices have a small uh, orbital velocity and the large vortices have the high velocity. And the lowest picture shows the same diagram, but uh, discusses what is happening with the energy which is put into the liquid by a laminar flow, which starts to develop a large vortices, which are this initial sign of the, that the turbulence is gonna to come. And the experimental fact is that there is an energy flow from the large eddies into the regions of a small eddies. So we have the, what we have to understood is how that follows up from the equations of the dynamics of the viscous fluid, which we already developed during our previous lectures. The, this phenomenon that the large vortices are decaying into the small vortices is, has been described in a short little poem by uh, British hydrodynamicians Richardson, who was one of the founding fathers of contemporary turbulence theory. And I quote here this uh, short poem, big whirls have little whirls, they heat on their velocity and little whirls have little whirls and so on to the viscosity. The most important part of that is the last line. Well, if we have this process of the energy flow that the large vortex decays into lots of small vortices, then we have a certain channel through which the energy is spread into the system. It's put into the system by some external perturbation which destroys the laminar flow. And then we have this, this, this energy, which was injected into the system by this external perturbation is spread all over this little edges. And what happens at the end? At the end, the energy, which is now distributed all over this little edges is gonna be dissipated by the existence of the viscosity. So there is a certain region in the, this transition of the energy which was fed into the system from a larger this into the heat 
in because the viscose dissipation eventually is gonna get rid of this external feed of the energy to the heat. And that is what we are not able to discuss by the isothermal description of the uh, flows of the liquids we discussed so far. And that final state of the dissipation happens due to the viscosity. So we have a certain range here where the viscosity of the flow is of lesser importance. And that region we will often refer to as the inertial region uh, in our analysis. Uh, so the a picture uh, looks like on this diagram. This is a logarithmic flow of the energy of the eddy with the size, which is on that picture denote as an inverse of it, the length. And that is the wave vector K. Uh, K is the proportion to the inverse size of the eddy. Then we are going to describe a, a cascade of eddies. We have a large eddies where the energy is being fed in. And then there is a kind of a cascade of the sizes of the eddies which we have seen on those diagrams from computer simulation for, or from real experiment into the region where the viscous dissipation happened. And this cascade of eddies is, has been described uh, for the first time by one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century, Russian mathematicians, Andrei Kolmogorov. Here there is a picture of Andrei Kolmogorov in the high school classroom for in addition of being a founding father of a contemporary probability theory and contributor to the most important theorems for nonlinear dynamics, uh, so-called Kolmogorov, Arnold, Moser theorems and many other Uh, areas of mathematics, Kolmogorov, Andrei Kolmogorov was extremely involved into teaching exact sciences, physics and mathematics to the high school children. And he had set up a, a chain of schools in Soviet Union, which were the schools for particularly uh, interested in mathematics and physics students. And that is a picture in one of those schools. The uh, Kolmogorov in the 30s uh, proposed a phenomenological theory of a turbulence, which is not a mathematical theorem in its sense. It's based on the scaling arguments the same simple scaling arguments we use discussing, for example, derivation of a stock slope. Uh, the, but there are many attempts to derive the Kolmogorov description of the eddy cascades. And I would like to show you the one which was the first attempt to describe a turbulence using uh, techniques developed in modern theoretical physics, particularly uh, a formulation of a perturbation theories used to solve uh, nonlinear equations 
and the Navier-Stokes equation, which describes the flow of incompressible fluid, uh, is nonlinear equation, as we remember. And uh, this, per this complicated perturbation theories to solve those equations have been simplified by using a diagrammatic technique, which for the first time were used by Richard Feynman in, uh, quantum, in the realm of a quantum electrodynamics and quantum field theory. So this formulation of a turbulence uh, was using a diagrammatic technique was proposed by, by Wilde. And I will show you the, how it looks like. Uh, that is our initial equation, which is the nonlinear Navier-Stokes equation for uh, uh, incompressible fluid. The coefficients nu is this kinematic viscosity, that is a shear viscosity divided by a density. And uh, we remember that the flow is incompressible. So instead of the density of the continuity equation, we have the equation that the divergence of the velocity is equal to zero. If the divergence of velocity is equal to zero, then we can apply a gradient operator to this equation. And then this term drops out because the Laplacian and divergence commute. So that this is equal to zero. And the partial derivative of velocity term is drops out. And we got the equation relating a pressure to the velocity. And that is this equation. The Laplacian of a pressure is a nonlinear function of the velocity and its gradient, basically on the gradient. In the vector indices notation, that looks pretty simple, much simpler than in a vector notation. It's just the density, which is a constant times a contraction of the tensor, which is a derivative of a velocity field. Well, that equation can be solved. We can solve that equation. And the pressure is given by a integral equation. And that one over four the denominator, the length of a vectors, difference of the length of the vectors r minus r prime, and it's just the green function of the Laplacian operator. And if we substitute into the Navier-Stokes equation, we obtain uh, the following form of the uh, Navier-Stokes equation. I move the viscosity term to the right. So I keep the linear parts of my equation on the left-hand side and nonlinear terms on the right hand side. Well, what you see is that for incompressible fluid, the uh, equation, Navier Stokes equation, is no longer a differential equation. It is integral differential equation. For on the right hand side, we have a, a term which depends on an integral of the gradients of the velocity field. So this is this looks that we have made already very complicated equation, even more complicated. But don't worry, we will continue with making this seemingly complicated uh, reformulation more usable. Uh, what I will now do. I will use the Fourier transform technique to look at this equation. Uh, the velocity field is decomposed into the Fourier components using this equation. 
And then the Fourier component, which is denoted by a tilde over a velocity field is given by the following expression of the velocity field. So if I apply the Fourier transform to this equation and the little f, which I have added on the right-hand side is the external force acting on the fluid, then the equation, uh, Navier-Stokes equation can be written in the following form. On the left-hand side, we have a time derivative of a Fourier component and we got rid of the Laplacian by replacing it in the Fourier after the Fourier transformation by just the square, square of the wave vector K. And on the right-hand side, we have a integral and the important point is that the integration is done over the wave vectors J and L, but in a way that the sum of the wave vectors J and L are equal to K. That is a tremendously important, the fact which follows from mathematics, strictly speaking. Okay, and there is the coefficient in the front of the integral which depends on the wave vector K, which for uh, certain reasons, I will call the vertex coefficient. And that will become clear why it's vertex. And this coefficient M sub zero is an algebraic expression in terms of operators P, which are given here. And that operator P is just a projection operator on the uh, on the uh, on the wave vector in the direction perpendicular to the wave vector k. So we have a purely algebraic expression for the vertex m, which is a tensor which has three indices, and therefore we have the this form of a, our equation. All right, let me rewrite that equation. And now I will try to solve that equation by a perturbation theory. Uh, the right-hand side of that equation is a nonlinear expression in terms of the velocity, Fourier components of the velocity. Those Fourier components of the velocity are our eddies are those elementary eddies which are created in the turbulent flow. And the size of those eddies is the inverse of the wave vector K or J or L, which sits in those Fourier components. So let me, we know that the, Nonlinear terms in the Navier Stokes equations are, if we rewrite everything in dimensionless units, are proportional to the inverse of the Reynolds number. Therefore, we can think about it that this right hand side is proportional to the small coefficient, formal small coefficient epsilon, which physically is just proportion to the inverse of the Reynolds number. And the Reynolds number is large, so that formal coefficient epsilon is small. So let me first look at this equation and let me try to solve that equation without the right-hand side. That is a linear equation and I can solve that equation right hand side, this operator sitting on the left hand side equal to the external force by using a quantity which in which I will call a resolvent operator that is a function of a wave vector k and in the and time which solves the following which is a solution 
for the following differential equation. This is a linear equation for the operator R. And I can easily calculate that operator R by doing a Fourier transform of this equation in terms of a, of a time. If I do the Fourier transform with respect to time, then the resolvent operator becomes a function of a wave vector K and the frequency omega and the exact expression for a Fourier transform of a resolvent R is proportion to the projection operator P and it has a denominator, which is the I omega plus mu times K squared. So if I now look at this upper equation in its full glory, then I can now write a formal solution for that equation in using the operator of a resolvent. I first have a solution of a homo of equation where I have dropped the term proportion to the M. M is symbolically proportion to this coefficient epsilon. This is a solution of a linear equation. And that is the term which still has the two news. So this is a nonlinear term in our former solution. So the new is given in terms of new. So that is a, how the equation we obtain from the Navier-Stokes equation is now susceptible to the perturbation expansion. Well, we can substitute to the expression for nonlinear terms in U, a linear, the term which is not proportion to the epsilon. If we substitute it there, then we will obtain a term which is proportion to the epsilon. And then if we substitute it again and again and again, we obtain a consecutive terms into the expansion of the velocity Fourier components of a velocity in terms of a formal series of the parameter epsilon. So omitting the these integrals, we will obtain an expansion of the velocity field into the formal power series of the epsilon. And we will have exact expressions for each of those coefficients, nu1, nu2, and so forth. Uh, for example, nu0 is that integral and Ah, uh, this is a complicated integral. So I will in further omit the integral and symbolically, I will denote this integration over time just by writing that I apply a integral operator R zero on the function F. Then the first term in the power of epsilon, the first contribution to the velocity is epsilon term R zero acting on the vertex and two operate velocities. And the second order term, which is of course proportion to epsilon square, but it has two M's and three V's and so forth and so forth and so forth. So I can, write a formal series. The question is, how can I combine now back all those terms to get the final expression for a velocity field? And the procedure of resumation, combining all those contributions proportion to different coefficients of epsilon 
into the final solution for a velocity field is easily done by a diagrammatic technique. Let me just give you a glimpse of how beautiful this diagrammatic technique, which as I said already, has been initiated by Feynman had, I mean, how beautiful is that procedure? Imagine that instead of a Fourier component of a velocity, we denoted the graphical as a line. The line which carry the three labels, a wave vector K, a time, and the index alpha. And the resolvent operator R0, of course, carry the vector way, K, vector K, but it has two ends. At its ends, it carry the time label T and the vector index alpha. And at the beginning, it has a time T prime and the vector index beta. And the uh, and the vertex M is, and that is why I call it vertex, it's a point in which three lines merge together, three velocities, the ve outgoing velocity, which is a solution, and two incoming eddies, the incoming eddies with the wave vector J and k minus j and the index vector index beta and gamma and the outgoing eddy has a wave vector k and the index alpha. So that explain why this tensor m I called, I should, I, I, I used to say that it is a, a, a vertex vector. So with this graphical uh, thing and again simplifying it, not writing explicitly all those indices, just by denoting the prop, the resolvent R0 as the dashed line and the velocities as the solid line and the vertex, uh, the vertex M as the points, I can write the formal solution of a Navier-Stokes equation as a diagram. And this is, for example, a diagram which corresponds to the second order correction to the, to the velocity. And with this kind of a diagrammatic technique, uh, theoreticians were able to propose various, uh, various ways of resuming this diagrammatic expansion which will eventually lead to the, the expression for a velocity field, which uh, fits the Kolmogorov hypothesis about the energy of the eddies cascade, uh, or uh, in fact, the experimental, experimental data. And one of those, methods of resummation of that perturbation expansion was proposed by Robert Kretschmann. Uh, and I mentioned Robert Kretschmann for Robert Kretschmann was the last uh, assistant of Albert Einstein at Princeton, who had spent most of his lifetime working on the turbulence theory and he was in some sense a very interesting scientist for he had never been employed by any research institution. He was always self-employed as a contractor. He was hired by various institutions to do the research, but he has never been a, a member of a faculty of any universities. And nevertheless, he was uh, one of the most important contributor to the theory of turbulence. And at the end of his life, he have come back to the general theory of relativity. The Kretschmann has proposed a certain resumation of those diagrams, which is called direct 
eddies interaction. And uh, that is a theory which is very close to really fitting up a Kolmogorov data. In the uh, eight, 70s and 80s of last century, uh, there was another suggestion how, of another formulation of a perturbation theory for that nonlinear version of a, a Navier-Stokes equation, which was based on a very general theory from the field theory developed by three American physicists, Paul Martin, Rose, and Shija. Paul Martin was at the time a dean of physics department at um, uh, Harvard. And um, that is another version of the grammatic uh, expansion of the Navier-Stokes equation, which is just as a special case of uh, a very powerful method in the field theory. But all those theories are really not able to really um, uh, fill up the details of the Kolmogorov model. So now I will um, uh, uh, use uh, a way of discussing a turbulence uh, phenomenon, those eddies cascade uh, by a and in an analogous way to the original Kolmogorov uh, uh, thinking. So let me recall that diagram, which is the cascade of the eddies. And uh, the wave vector is related to the, it's, it's inverse of the size of the eddy and the size will be called L. And as you remember, the important point in the Navier-Stokes equation was this interaction of the eddies, that the two eddies given described by this nonlinear integral term, they interact with each other to creating a, a way, a, a eddy, a outcoming eddy, and the sum of the wave vectors in that vertex is such that the sum of incoming wave vectors is if even the outgoing vector K. So the vertices, this elementary eddy interactions uh, is fulfilled the law of a conservation of a wave vector. The incoming sum of the wave vectors K is equal to the outgoing wave vector K. So we shall analyze the processes like this. And that was the idea of Kolmogorov that we look at the, at the situation where the uh, a difference between the outgoing vector K and one of the incoming vectors, for example, J, which I denoted as a vector kappa is pretty small. And that of course, the outgoing vector K is twice the incoming vector J. And that means that the size of the eddy is twice smaller than the uh, size of the incoming eddies. So the interact, we have the cascade in the restricted way given by the, this relation. And uh, in the Kolmogorov analysis, the two assumptions play the very important role. Namely, the first assumption that the, the energy of an eddy with the inverse size k is proportional to the wave vector is a function, I'm sorry, is a function of a wave vector k and the quantity epsilon, which don't confuse it with the epsilon, which I use in the as a formal expansion parameter in a white formulation, it's energy dissipation per unit mass of the liquid. And the second assumption in Kolmogorov was that the upper limit of a K vectors is, uh, depends on the viscosity 
and is the function only of the viscosity, kinematic viscosity nu and the, and the energy dissipation per unit mass epsilon. So now let's us remember the important ingredients of the scaling, namely that the wave vector K scales as a one over size. The energy dissipation per unit mass scale as a R square over the time unit to the power three. Shear viscosity, kinematic shear viscosity, scales as the length to this power two divided by time. And the energy of the eddy scales as a LQ, L cube divided by the square of the time unit. All right, so that is what we just said. And the, the same assumption which we have used discussing the analysis of a stocks is that now that we make an assumption that the epsilon, the energy of an eddy of a size k is proportional to the wave vector k to the power a and the epsilon energy density per unit, dissipation energy density per unit mass is at the, to the power b. And the c is a numerical coefficient which we will probably be unable to guess. So if we have that, if we make, if we have made that assumption, then uh, that is the explicit equation which relates the epsilon, which scales as L cube over T square to the right-hand side, which depends on the polar combination power of A, B, and A and B. And that is trivial to solve. And what comes out is that the time that the index, that the exponent B is equal to the two thirds and the exponent A is equal to the minus five third. So if I put it back into the, my assumption, then I obtain expression that the energy of an eddy with the inverse size k is proportional to the epsilon to the power two third and the inversely proportional to the power five three for the wave vector k. And that is precisely the Kolmogorov spectrum, which Kolmogorov has suggested in his theory. Similarly, we can calculate the, in the size of the eddy with an index nu, the inverse size, which again, I make an assumption is proportion to the viscosity to certain power C and the dissipation energy density to the power D. And when I put up the explicit expressions, I have the following scaling relation. And that is having the following solution that the index at C is equal minus three fourth and D is one fourth. And therefore the uh, K nu scales as a shear viscosity to the power minus three fourth and the energy dissipation energy density as a power one fourth. So this is this scaling analysis of the Eddy's cascade, which um, is very difficult, let me phrase it this way, is very difficult, if at all possible, to derive using all these sophisticated techniques which we have so far, just outlined so far. The same uh, technique, the scaling technique can be used to uh, derive or explain the another Kolmogorov assumption that the eddy velocity depends on its size and the energy dissipation. And again, this because the velocity scales 
as the length to the power alpha and energy dissipation to the power beta, the scaling relation can easily be solved. And the, if we denote the maximum size of the eddy as L and the minimum size of the eddy as a one over inverse of the size of the wave vector K with index nu, then we derive the expression for the ratio of the L max over L min, which is given by this rather lengthy expression. But if we look at it up, that is the Reynolds number to the power three half. So the ratio of a large and small sizes of the eddies within the region where the Kolmogorov hypothesis is supposed to work. And that is precisely what at the beginning we call inertial region. Then it is, the size is given as a rate of number to the power three fourth. And that means that if the rate of number is large, then this region is really, really huge. And probably for a large Reynolds number, the phenomenological scaling analysis by Kolmogorov should work pretty well. And um, the same is that the velocities, the maximum velocity of the orbital velocity in the eddy to the minimum scales epsilon Reynolds number to the power one fourth. And uh, that is a comparison of the Kolmogorov spectrum analysis with combined experimental data. And as you see, they fit pretty well. And we have a data for it tidal channels, boundary layers, uh, wake behind a moving cylinder, pipe flow, homogeneous shear flow, grid turbulence, that is what is used in the wind tunnels where we have a blow of a very high speed laminar flow which comes to a grid, a metal grid, and right after behind that grid, there is uh, a turbulent flow and the uh, uh, traces wake behind the cylinder and uh, the other experiments of grid turbulence. And as you see, that fits pretty well with the Kolmogorov spectrum. So that is basically what I would like to tell you about the theory of turbulence. And with this, we will uh, uh, stop our discussion of uh, flows of the viscous fluids. And uh, uh, that was, I believe, it is essential, I believe, that uh, we understand that the continuous media theory can benefit a lot from a contemporary development of a contemporary physics. And it has developed tremendously from the computer simulations, but also to show that it is still one of the most uh, uh, complicated problems uh, science encounter. So next time you fly uh, uh, on the airplane and the pilots comes on the intercom and says that you will ex that uh, you should buckle up because we will the plane will enter a turbulence a region. Uh, I hope you will uh, have that short blick of your mind. Okay, so now I will feel the Kolmogorov spectrum of a turbulence. And not only I will feel it, but basically I know how it comes about. Uh, thanks a lot and see you next week. Bye-bye.